The Underground is one of the most famous transport networks in the world. It surpasses a mere method of getting around and has risen to the status of an icon of London. And well it might, it was the first underground railway network and provided the template for many other such systems around the world. As brands go, it's one of the great success stories. But here's the thing, it wasn't always called the underground. Rather, it was a set of similar but unconnected railways that were owned by individual companies and went by their own individual names. The first line that opened in 1863 wasn't known as the Underground, but the Metropolitan Railway. So when did the brand first appear? Well, it all goes back to the early 20th century and a man you may have heard of, Charles Yerkes. Yerkes was an American businessman who'd come to London with the intention of investing in the burgeoning network of small U underground railways. He had started with forming a company to electrify the district railway, but quickly bought out the whole line, then the companies that would become the Bakerloo and Piccadilly lines. But financially speaking, his eyes had been bigger than his stomach, and he'd need more money to make all this work. He approached the Speyer Brothers, financiers based in the City of London, about forming a new company to get all this built. The new company was to be called the Underground Electric Railways Company of London Limited, or UERL for short. So, for the first time, the word underground appeared in a brand name associated with the network. Well, they probably wouldn't have called it a brand name back then. Company name, let's say. But UERL weren't the only underground railway company. There was the Metropolitan Railway, the City and South London Railway, the Central London Railway, the Great Northern and City Railway, and the Waterloo and City Railway. And the underground railways weren't the only game in town when it came to public transport. Buses and trams provided fierce competition. The deadliest battleground was fares. A bus couldn't compete with a train on speed, and a train couldn't compete with a tram on convenience. But money was something they all had in common. Consequently, they fought to provide the lowest fares. In the case of the underground railways, it was a fight they couldn't win. Tube trains simply cost more to run than buses or trams. And buses, in turn, were in competition with each other. This was still the age of the pirate bus, when several operators might run the same route, undercutting each other's fares. The so-called pirate buses were cheap and fast, but recklessly driven and dangerous, as compared to the more respectable operators. In 1906, UERL had hired Sir George Gibb as their managing director and deputy chairman. Gibb had been the general manager of the North Eastern Railway. Gibb was a great enthusiast for American ways of running a railway, both in terms of administration and embracing modern technology. It was natural that the heavily American-influenced UERL would headhunt him. At the time, UERL was in very poor financial shape. Charles Yerkes hadn't just brought the good American ways of doing business with him, he'd also brought the kind of financial jiggery-pokery that had destroyed his reputation in Philadelphia, Chicago, and New York. That, combined with the fact that the tube lines just weren't the instant moneymaker their investors had hoped for, meant that the new network was in danger of collapsing when it had barely begun. But Gibb liked a challenge. The first order of business was to eliminate competition, not by aggressive undercutting, but by negotiation. In June 1907, a meeting was held between representatives of UERL, the Metropolitan Railway, and the Central London Railway. They mutually agreed to raise their fares. That being done, Gibb arranged a second meeting, forming the London Passenger Transport Conference. This not only involved Metropolitan, Central London, and UERL representatives, but also those of the City and South London Railway and the Great Northern and City Railway. Perhaps surprisingly, also present were the London General Omnibus Company, London United Tramways, and the Tilling, Star, and Vanguard bus operators. One surface railway was represented in the form of the North London Railway. The outcome was the coordination of fares, the elimination of many duplicate routes, and the introduction of through-booking. That is to say, you could get one ticket that would cover your entire journey, even if it involved more than one form of transport. 
These were known as TOT, or Train Omnibus Tram Tickets, and they made organising your journey vastly more convenient. In fact, you could argue that they were the predecessor to things like travel cards and oyster cards. Now, this didn't totally eliminate the competition between different modes. Over the coming months, as more operators came into the conference fold, disagreements arose. The bus companies in particular felt like they were getting the short end of the stick and soon abandoned the agreement to raise their fares. But what it did mean was that an alliance was firmly cemented between nearly all the different underground railways. The only exception was the Waterloo and City, which was firmly under the wing of the much larger London and South Western Railway. With all this in place, it's time to talk about one of the most important figures in the history of the underground, Albert Stanley. Stanley had been born in Britain, but raised in America. In many ways, we might call him the first transit nerd. He'd become fascinated by trams as a child, and joined the Detroit tramways as a messenger at the age of 14. By 20, he was general superintendent. By the age of 32, he was general manager of the Public Service Corporation of New Jersey. He, too, was headhunted by UERL, and became general manager in 1907. He saw great possibilities in the network, especially now the different lines were working together on fares. He imagined all the lines operating as a single system. As far as the passenger was concerned, there should be no substantial difference between, say, the Metropolitan Railway and the city in South London. There would not only be consistent fares, but consistent signage and advertising. And regardless of which company owned them, all these lines would operate under a single title. Underground. In December 1907, the different railway companies agreed, and so, in 1908, the new brand was rolled out. It was a hit. Stanley quickly followed it up with the first underground maps, and that same year, a prototypical version of the Roundel logo began to appear on platforms. The group also tried to discourage people from referring to the railways as tube lines, but this was far less successful. Nevertheless, in a few short months, Gibb and Stanley had not only saved the network, but had laid the foundations of the modern underground. Well, I hope you enjoyed this forward-thinking tale from the Tube. If you did, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. I'd like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon, and here on YouTube, you are the George Gibb to my failing company. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the Tube.